Hey, it's Jamie again, and I've got John Cutler here. I've talked about him in a couple of my other videos about feature factories, his concept around that that's super popular, and a lot of other things. But I thought it'd be great to have John on here and talk about uh, some of the topics that I've talked to you all about on this channel, specifically around, I know a lot of you out there are kind of mid-career developers, and it can get kind of difficult at that phase of your career. So I'll open it up to John and kind of wanted to start by just talking about, I really liked when I found your articles on Medium um, that you at least struck me as someone with a lot of experience in you know, product management and agile with a real compassion for the dev side. Um, and I heard one of the talks, you know, that you gave uh, that somebody videoed, I think it was in Hamburg or something like that, um, somewhere in Germany, I think it was, where, you know, you were talking about, hey, when's the last time that you, you know, removed a feature from your backlog and things like that. And, and it was great. So, like, as I've said, this channel, I talk to people a lot about, you know, me having uh, been a developer for the first 10 years of my career, I was an architect, you know, just worked at different companies. And then I switched into consulting. Uh, I keep going to kind of like company after company after company and running into developers that are really jaded and they're kind of disillusioned by how their company has implemented Agile um, to the point now where... Like, if I go on Twitter and I look at, like, things you are sharing and a lot of other people in the industry, it's kind of like I hear more people talking about what not to do in Agile than I do about what to do. And so, like, one of the things I want to ask you about and just kind of get your opinion on was, like, is there something that you think maybe we can all be doing in the industry to kind of rescue the reputation a little bit of Agile in that, um, I know in some circles, I think it's still just as popular as ever, but I, I, I'm concerned just myself that at least the development community, I feel like there's a real like, yeah, Agile's dead, we're on to the next thing. And then when you ask them what the next thing it is, it kind of sounds like the original Agile principles, but I don't know. That's just my perception. So I'll get your read on, on what you think's going on. Yeah, I mean, there. I think that it's important to kind of view it from a historical context. And that's, that's what I've been trying to do that the you know, the Agile Manifesto was like a bunch of awesome nerds, like just like us, kind of going and sharing what was working over the last decade or so and saying, you know, what are these common what are these common things between these different things we've been doing and like what's the same? Right. Right. And so I think that I think we sometimes put it on a pedestal or, or some folks put it on a pedestal and really I, I think that even if you talk to those folks, I mean, Im imagine that you and I or a group of people got together, you know, next week at some ski resort and we'd put in these common themes about what we saw working or not. You know, we probably wouldn't want people to put it on a pedestal. Right. And we'd probably want people to kind of take it in the context of the time of like a bunch of makers and dorks and nerds and, yeah. you know, and I say that in the nicest way. For of those course. Folks. All men, but, but I think there were some women invited. I'm not sure about that. But so I think that, you know, I think that I, I wrote this uh, post once called The Way of Ways, which was just about how things like Agile or DevOps or any of these things actually take a trajectory, even like products, you know, like there's an early right. adopters and there's people who are really passionate or on the ground floor and then it kind of takes this other route. And so I think you're seeing right now what you would expect to see from a quote unquote product or an idea that it kind of like had 20 years under it right? Or 30 years under or whatever. And so, you know, I say the same thing with certain types of music. I mean, there was music I was really into in the 90s. And when I look back on it, I'd be like, well, what, what was I really into then? You know, now right. I can't, I can't even look at it through the lens anymore right. without thinking of it through all the music in the late 90s and the 2000s and, and the teens and whatever. <laughs> so, right. I don't know. I, it's kind of a long roundabout way of saying that I think that there's too much talk about maybe what it is or what it isn't. And then just not enough talk about like, what are people doing today that's working and what's not working. And that, that's actually, you know, right there in the, the, the sort of principles in the agile manifesto, you know, we're exploring ways, you know, I can't even quote it off the top of my head, but we're exploring right. things that, that work and we're trying to teach people about what exactly. works. Right? So I think that, and, and the reality is too, is that there is an agile industrial complex. Like there's a whole, 
There's a whole, just like there's a DevOps industrial complex yes. and just like there's any of this. And so I think it's very hard for people to disassociate that with, you know, um, hey, what's working? You know, right. what's what's going on? And I'd actually give a lot of props to the DevOps community. I think that the, you know, like Gene Kim and Jez Humble and folks like that, like they're really taking it seriously with their conferences and stuff, kind of making sure that people know that it's about what's working. Right. You know, out there in the world, whereas a lot of the agile conferences, it's a lot of agile coaches getting together. Right. And usually a kind of industrial agile complex sponsored track, which is the scaling track. And so it's more about the coaches, where if you go to a DevOps conference, it's not a lot of DevOps coaches. It's actually, you know, the CTO of Starbucks talking about their transformation. You know, there's it's a lot of things. So I don't know. I'm, I'm not taking jabs at agile with that. I'm just sort of saying that that it's it's it all has to be taken in context um and i think for the developers who are struggling with you know what's next or i hate agile or those things it's you know you just kind of got to take a step back and just be like yeah these are just kind of words and movements and like what what pragmatically what is working what can i learn from etc so i don't know if that resonates with you at all it's it's that's how i've been viewing it no it, it totally does so I wanted to run one thing by you you were making me think of that I talk about a lot on this channel, and I've seen you tweet about it too. Why do you think leaders and, and startup founders are so resistant to budget in a way where they leave more money on the table so that customers, when they give them feedback on their kind of early ideas, they're, they're budgeted more to be able to actually spend money changing their ideas to really deliver something good and i know you know uh vcs and and you know companies that are going and getting kind of initial funding usually are in maybe a little bit better position to do that than like an enterprise that's doing it all Mm -hmm. internally um but i just kind of throwing that out there i don't know if you see that as much as me i mean there is this interesting movement called beyond budgeting which is kind of a really interesting thing okay um because I think it kind of cuts to the core of what you're saying. But even stepping back from beyond budgeting, I think it's it's kind of critical to view this again in the long view, right? The, the idea that, that you can do what we do with software today versus even what you could do with software in the late 90s, for example, in terms of just, oh, we're going to spin up some machines and we're going to get some stuff out there and we're going to hit AWS and we're going to do this kind of stuff. Like, it all feels very sort of, um, normal to us, the rate of change that's happening with software, but in the long view, and you know, companies and practices tend to be built in the long view, it's still very much a project centric approach, you know, yes. like what, what project are you going to build and do these things. And so one thing yes. that I found is that it's easy when you're in the trenches to kind of, you see this, right? Because you touch the machine, you know, you, you kind of, you're in, you've got your hands in it. And it's easy to kind of, for it all to make sense in your mind, you know, you can be like, oh, I, I get it. You know, this is more like continuous delivery and we're going to keep adapting what we're doing and we're going to keep, we're, we have this opportunity, we're going to seize that new opportunity. But but the, my understanding lately has just been, you, you it's, it's hard to unwind decades worth of thinking. Oh, hell yes. Um, and also, in, and also, it's not really... Sometimes I get a little bit kind of angsty about it and like, ah, oh, these, you know, these idiots can't figure it out. But I catch myself and I say like, no, no, that's not like an effective uh, way to, to, to frame this. Right. right. Like, Absolutely. And, and so what, so I think that what it means is that a lot of these people who budget that way have never seen it work. Right. Have exactly. never seen this idea, and and this is something that I've encountered a lot lately, even with a lot of consultants that I know. Like I'll talk to a consultant or talk to a coach at a conference, and you know, over beers after the talk is done, I'll be like, "How many times have you seen it work? Really work?" And they'll say, "Well, there was this one team back in 2013, and and then you know, I'll say, "Well, how many times between 2013 and now have you right. seen it work?" They're like, "Well, but I had this one engagement and almost worked, but then they you know they killed the project." And then I had this other engagement and I thought it would work, but then, but then I kind of got hints of it working. And then I read this article about Spotify, so I know it works. <laughs> and, you know, like, it's not really about seeing it work. Right. And so what I've, when I think about it that way, and I think about pretty logical, you know, rational people saying, you know, show me the alternative. Right. You know, so, 
The alternative is something where you're doing like throughput type accounting, right? You just, you have a value stream, you're interested in investing in, in exploiting that value stream and you continue to invest in it as long as you continue to make money in that value stream. And it's similar to right. maybe like an amusement park or something, you know, you, you, you know, amusement park has capital expenditures, you have to build right. rides, you have to do the same, but it's also a service ecosystem. You know, it's exactly. something where you're enhancing it all the time. Yep. So it makes sense to you or me, and it probably makes sense to a lot of finance people, you know, taken out of the context of their companies, if I explain it to them like that. But, what, you know, when, when you hit brass tacks, right, you think about have you seen it work, most people haven't seen it work, and they haven't shown to their company that it could possibly work. Right. You know, what would it be like to release weekly and have customers use new stuff in their environment with their own data and give you feedback what does it look like to invite customers into the development process external customers into yep. the development process what does it look like to have no production issues for a quarter right you know like I, right. and, and like take that one for example from the more like development angle i've been in situations where i've talked to seasoned developers i know and i'll say hey i'm at a company right now where we haven't had a production issue in a quarter and they'll say well you're lying You've totally had them. <laughs> you're just not admitting. Them. No, right. like, no, actually, we didn't have a production issue for a quarter. And when we did, it was like stop everything. All right. developers stopped, and you had a hundred people kind of go to the middle of the room and say, "Let's learn about it." Right. No, you're lying. Right. N no way. That that would never work. Yeah, and th there was actually, you know, there's high test coverage. Oh no, that that TDD is a waste of time. Like, there's no way you could have built that fast if you were doing TDD. You're lying. Right. And this is a good friend of mine, right? And so I think when it, that's when it really hit me that we're not do, we're doing a lot of telling but not enough showing. And then at the end of the day, it's about kind of making smallish experiments work in your company yep. and, and trying to do that. And so I think that from, from a, an angst-ridden developer standpoint, I think that the loop that you get caught in is uh, they don't understand, they don't understand tech debt, they're, they're driving us, I'm just going to work here for two or three years and find the next job, they don't get it. It's all the same. Yep. And then from the business's standpoint, it's like all these developers are so apathetic, like yep. they, they don't, they don't explain it to us, they don't, so, so this is a systems problem, right? And everyone takes it very personally, but if you kind of step back from it and you're like, wow, they haven't seen it work, and to be honest, I haven't seen it work all that often too. Right. So, you know, except that one time I did a startup for three months and it was Greenfield and everything was fine and then it all went to shit. So they don't, <laughs> right. you know, so, so, yeah. so if you take that, we, neither of us have really seen it work. We're all kind of going on faith here. How can we create small experiments that create trust mm -hmm. and create confidence in the thing and then keep moving? I don't know if that answers your question, but it's kind of like I've been taking the long view a lot more with this type of stuff and, and it's, I'm not so... I try not to get as bogged down in the, in the drama, which is really easy to get caught up in. <laughs> Absolutely. No, your experience sounds very similar to mine as far as the conclusions you're coming to. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that uh, I talk about on my channel, and it gets to kind of what you're talking about, is, you know, I kind of believe, and I'm, I think most people do that have been doing this for a while, that you know, no software project's going to really be perfect. There's always going to be compromises that people have to make. Um, there's always going to be quote unquote best practices that won't work in certain situations. They just won't, right. you know, and a lot of times it's due to the business or partnerships or, you know, just leadership and their, their comfort with different things. But, you know, one of the things you talked about as far as, you know, making a small impact, you know, that, and the kind of growing it from there, you know, I had a boss, gosh, years ago now who I kind of came up under <clears throat> and he had a lot of faith in me. Uh, he was a really amazing guy. And we, we would always get into trouble at these companies though, because, you know, we'd go into a company and, you know, this was 2000 to 2005 around that period. You know, we'd go into a company that was building a new product and, you know, Agile was still new at that time. There were hardly even any tools and we'd kind of put stuff in place, but we'd try to do too much. You know, we'd try to do the boil the ocean kind of approach and, and frankly piss off a lot of people. Yeah. And so, you know, I definitely learned that, you know, this has to be an incremental thing. <clears throat> I, I think the thing that just concerns me, though, is, you know, 
it's kind of like the whole personal responsibility versus like somebody else's responsibility issue. Like when I think about myself in times in the past in my career or a lot of these people I run into on Reddit that are kind of frustrated with their job or the industry, I feel like there's this kind of apathy, like, you know, they just don't get it. You know, they're never going to do it. You know, they being maybe management or if it's management, right. the developers, you know. So this is just kind of the way the situation is. And then, you know, as developers, I think they kind of just look for what are ways I can sort of shield myself from the implications right. of the fact that the system isn't the way I want it to be. Well, I would argue that like Scrum even, for example, I think that there's even practices that people have that contribute to that shielding. Absolutely. You know, it sort of contributes to this idea of like, um, you know, I mean, even the product manager role, it's very interesting. In some organizations, they pitch it as the translator, you know, that somehow right. like the business will talk to the product manager and the product manager will talk to the team and the team would never want to talk to the business. Like they're never right. going to speak the same language. You would never be able to get that. And I, I frankly don't, I don't think that translator role is a very resilient idea. I don't either. In an organization, because it's kind of making you important, but it doesn't necessarily make the business more resilient and connect people. And in my experience, the only way to make it work is to work side by side. And this is, you know, an agile, the agile manifesto, you know, working side by side yep. all the time. But even people, even a lot of agilists I know, when they read that part of the agile manifesto, they think, oh, they mean the product owner or the internal user. That's the business person, you know? So if you're a user, that's who they're talking about. Or if you're the product owner, that's who they're talking about. They're not necessarily thinking about sitting in on a meeting and learning about the business strategy or, you know, on doing all these various things. It's kind of like, they're still thinking in a lot of cases, a proxy, right? Absolutely. So I think that, and so here's the deal though. If you get a bunch of developers and business people together and you throw them in a room, they start working for at least three months, they'll be speaking completely different languages. Right. And in fact, a lot of the stuff that the business people say will absolutely trigger, trigger the developers. And a lot of the things the developers say will absolutely trigger the business people. Of course. You know, and, and they, they, so the only way you can create progress there is create a space where you're sort of like, you guys aren't going to understand each other for a while, but you're going to work together. Right. And make it happen and do that. And so back to that problem of the apathy problem is like, so once you're de deep down the apathy hole and you think that it's never going to be solved, you're never going to be able to unwind your thought process to be able to go into a meeting like that and take right. it seriously. You're all, you know, you'll come out of a meeting that seemed to go okay. And the CEO kind of said something that rubbed you the wrong way. You'll come out of that meeting that normally was a pretty positive meeting. Right. And you'll come out of it saying they don't understand. They, right. they, they'll never understand. They, they don't respect us. They don't do this thing. So once you have that apathy in place, it, it, it clouds all these particular things that you're processing when you're working. And, and I don't think that it's, and it, but I think that the one point here is I'm not, I think a lot of people say, well, you got to clean up that apathy problem right now because I see some bad attitude. You know, that's like a, you know, so, so the whole idea of, I don't think you need to solve these problems to somehow better be a quote unquote better team player or whatever. I think you need to solve them to make your career more rewarding. Right. And that's right. what I find out when I talk to developers is that they care deeply about an impact, but they basically talk themselves out of that being a reality. Like, Hey, I got into this to solve cool problems and do cool things with technology, but that's not how reality is these days. It's just a shit show. Right. So it's not, so it's, so you see what I'm saying? It's not management yeah. saying you guys better clean up your apathy problems so that you can be better, whatever, you know, cogs in the wheel. It's actually like, Hey, if you cleaned up this app, if we cleaned up this dynamic, we'd all have far more rewarding work. We would like coming to work. And wouldn't that be cool for us? So it's kind of, I don't know. I'm trying to clarify that, that I'm not saying this as a, uh, kind of, you bet you better clean up that attitude kind of thing if that makes sense <laughs> no it does and i i did this video it was probably about three weeks ago now that was called um healing the rift between programmers and managers i think it was called and i just kind of told a story of uh i do some videos where i give like tips and then i do others where i just tell stories from my career but one of the things I, I am trying to kind of challenge people a little bit with is, you know, the popular, I think, programmer identity out there, at least for the like kind of 
18 to 25, you know, and I, I know I'm stereotyping and it's not fair, but I'm just going to throw it out there. There's a right. lot of people, I think, that get into this. They're really excited by the technology, right? Like I think of my dad used to love those old school, like gadget magazines. You'd read on the plane or you'd get them in the mail, you know, with all these gadgets. It's like, I think, you know, software development can kind of feed this part of us that wants to tinker with things and like feel like, ooh, right. we're using all this advanced stuff. But then it's like you get into these projects and depending on the culture, I think, as, and, and I can only speak for myself and other people I've met. I think sometimes when you're new to the industry and you're a developer, you know, you look around and you kind of see all these other developers and they're kind of, you know, depending again on the culture, but they're a little bit maybe more laid back. They're able to kind of like, you know, they'll show up at the scrum meeting, but then they just want to code <laughs> or whatever, you know. And when I got into consulting, you know, that was completely different work for me. This was actually more like, you know, uh, convincing your client of things and, and right. you know, having a good reputation and demonstrating integrity and things like that. And so, you know, one of the things I'm trying to kind of start teaching people on my YouTube channel, and it's still kind of going in all kinds of directions where this thing's going, is I'm trying to teach some developers and, you know, operations people, UX, whatever, some kind of basic consulting skills and not from a, like, Here's how to write oh, a contract, but more yeah. from a, here's how your interactions with people, you know, affect your reputation long term. And here's how you get to know people personally. So when you're pitching things to them, it's not just like, oh yeah, the guy who sits in the queue behind me, I'm going to go have a presentation <laughs> and try to convince him. You know, it's like, I know this person and I know their right. pain and I know, you know, obviously to the level they're going to share with you. But so I, I just really feel like, you know, looking forward, you know, who knows what this industry is going to bring. It's going to continue to change. There's going to be all kinds of innovation right. and disruption. But I think as individuals, if we're always looking to management or the industry or something else to fix the system, to make it like better for us right. in our job, I think we're really doing ourselves a disservice because, you know, every developer that's out there. There are some companies that treat you, like you were saying, kind of like a cog in a wheel, you know? And, right. and if you as a well, developer perpetuate that, right, by, yeah. by so going... I think you're talking about being marketable, you know, like, is, and yeah. also from... from and, and I think that a lot of developers, so when I... Developer friends of mine, when I... I say the very similar thing that you're saying. And what's interesting is I think a lot of them assume this to be like, again, and they see their friend that no one bothers. Right. right. They see their friend that's like, oh, I have this buddy at Google and no one has asked them what they're doing for three months. They just do this thing. Right. Right. And and I think that like, well, first of all, that's what your friend's saying. So you don't always know if that's actually it. Right. Right. And a lot of times you're hearing about developers do that when they're in a big like greenfield exploratory part effort. Right. So yes. you're only hearing that from when they got some green light to do something and then we're able to go deep. Right. So so it's kind of interesting to me that like. I think that a lot of developer friends assume, oh, you mean I got to learn how to do politics? I got to learn how to do all these. You know, I got to learn how to be like a slime ball. Exactly. And and, and I don't. It's not like that exactly. at all. Exactly. You know, like there's. I think that there's just some core. There's some core skills, and and frankly, the the cool thing about it is that if you master those skills, you're actually able to negotiate your ability to go off and do whatever hell you want for months on. Absolutely. Right? That's what I'm so, telling so people on this channel. Like, yep. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so it's kind of like um, I think it's a it's like any skill you know that that you pick up, but but the idea that because you do that once, you're going to end up doing it for all your day, like right. oh, you know, I'm I'm going to use some some and and it's amazing though. I think just some very basic things like you know what promises have I kept, following up on those promises, like just like dotting your eyes a little bit, doing those yep. things seem like a waste of time, but oh my god, to hear people talk about that and then talk about whether it's tabs versus spaces for a long time i mean you're talking about the same right you're talking about you're talking about being really particular and anal about things right yep. so so you know just a little bit of that stuff can make you i mean i i remember a developer i know who would always show up with a great notebook and you could see that they were always in meetings kind of taking a couple notes things reminders to themselves and when they were working when they were coding too that they were just diligent they were keeping a kind of diary about what they were doing not to track time or anything like that, but just sort of like that you could tell that they were taking a very like 
disciplined approach to their craft that they extended beyond just being at the computer. They extended that to being at meetings and yep. figuring out what they needed to do. And I'll tell you, that person was given more leeway to do whatever the hell they want and, and high, have high impact efforts than the people who just kind of wandered through the day for sure um, and didn't do that so you know i'm not saying everyone needs to be like a jira monkey or anything like that i'm right. just saying that, that i think that stuff goes a long way definitely fact, i've noticed it's gone a long way definitely and i mean you know i i would feel kind of bad after i was a consultant for about six seven years because i mean once you develop these skills you know i'd go into a, a client and i'd be talking with you know all their c levels and then I'd talk to a few of their guys. I'd kind of, you know, just get to know the culture, try to figure out who the players are. And and then, you know, there'd be people who had worked there for like 10, you know, 8, 10 years who'd been pitching an idea. Right. And I'd come in, find out what the idea was, be like, hey, you know, I'm meeting with him or her, you know, next week. Do you oh, want me to really kind of talk yeah. about it? And then, boom, they go for it. You know, and and I mean, the one thing I learned early on is then you give the credit to your client. You know, you don't just right, come absolutely. in, hey, I'm a consultant, I came up with this. That's not cool. But yeah. it's like what I did, the only thing that I did was I listened in the meeting when I would meet with the business more to understand what are the what are the things driving their concerns. You know, not like, right. I, I think too often as programmers, and I've talked about this a lot, you know, we will need to convince something of somebody of something and we'll come in and we'll try to demonstrate here's all the technical things that this brings us um right. when the people usually in those meetings they just want how are you going to avoid you know risk for me or how is this going to actually cause more revenue or you know how's this going to make right and it's just putting the work that we do as developers or, or something we want to suggest into terms that non-technical people can understand. It, it just blows my mind how many like fantastic developers out there there are that can't really do that. And they look at it like, well, that's not my job. You know, if they don't understand, yeah. well, that's because they're not technical enough. You know what I mean? Right. And I just don't think that serves anybody. I think, I mean, it's not, I think it's natural in a lot of, of course, careers to do that. But, but actually to, to the point about being, you know, I think that, I mean, let's just get even r r like super real for a second. Like it's becoming a global marketplace for both talent and for all sorts of things. Right. Yep. So, you know, from the standpoint of, you know, and let me put it this way is like, if you have a developer as a product manager thinking, if I have a developer, I'm able to have these conversations with. Who, like I've worked with teams that UX and the developers on the team could pretty much run with the problem. Right. Completely. Yep. I just needed to kind of like describe a metric or describe something that I wanted them to try to go and they could just go for it. Awesome. So I, I could be very, like I had a high leverage in that situation and, and you know, the, the UX person on that team could also like co-design with people. There was a lot of respect there. Sweet. And man, like talk about, so the whole, you know, the 10X developer thing, this was like a 10X team which is a lot different, you know, nice. in, in my mind, but it was, it was very, it's like, that is so different. And it also relates, this is another thing too, is it relates to your organization. Like if you, if you need translators at every stage, then you need to create an incredible hierarchy in your right. company, right? So then you get this idea of an engineering manager for five developers, like five developers probably don't need a manager yeah. like that. You could have a director who might have 12 or 14 people who, who like maybe along with an agile coach or whatever, like they kind of create a nice unit of people together and smaller teams within that. Like that could probably work, but you don't need this, like, um, you don't need two more levels of hierarchy, right? Well, how, because you've got. How much do know, you think I'm, that's. No, no, I, I hear what you're saying. How much do you think. And I'm not disagreeing with your saying. I'm just thinking yeah. I've seen it done so many ways. Yeah. How much do you think uh, that statement you made about, you know, if you got five developers, you probably don't need an engineering manager over them is yeah. kind of dependent on the maturity of the developers? Because yeah, I will say... That, exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. What, I know. I would agree with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but, my, but my point is it's self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Like, I, I think it takes... So in my, my uh, you know, estimation, it takes... a. Uh, so I worked at a company that could take kind of like a new grad out of school and within a year or two could get them to that point where they, they, could, they could really be a member of one of these self-contained, sustained teams without an engine, a manager breathing down their neck, right? 
but it wasn't an immediate thing. And, and sure. if they weren't entering a resilient organization, like if all the other people on that team couldn't help bring them up, then you, you might need a manager on that particular team to do that. And so I think that that's, and that's another thing too, from, a, again, like when people think about their careers and the skills that they need to manifest, like if you don't want to have to be on a team with a manager, an engineering manager, a product manager, and a bunch of people breathing down your neck, you're going to have to develop some of the skills to, to either get a job in an organization where you can demonstrate your ability to work without that level yep. of supervision, or in your current organization, be able to demonstrate that you guys, you really don't need that level of supervision to do that. And, and I think a lot of people will get kind of like, will bristle at this talk of managers and management and super, my use of the word supervision or whatever. But I, you know, I would invite them to like, come into the standpoint of like a business owner or someone who has skin in the game or money in the game. Um, and also consider the amount of times you've been on a team where you're kind of like, oh, you know, like Mary just doesn't get it. I mean, I need to sit there and supervise her, you know, like, so if you remove any like notions about management or whatever from this, it's, it's about learning. So when I use the word management, there is supervision. I'm just talking about guidance, coaching or whatever. Right. Um, and, and to back to my analogy, you literally couldn't take the new grad. If you had a team of all new grads on a team, um, they, you might, after five years, watch them flounder and figure it out. But if you wanted them to come up to speed in a year or two, you needed to intermingle them with people who had done it before. Yes. Um, so, I don't know. I think it's, in, yeah, it is interesting. Um, but yeah, take it seriously. Like, that, that stuff's really important if you take that side seriously. And then you become more independent and autonomous and you become less reliant over right. the course of your career, I think. Right. No, I, I agree completely. And, you know, having worked myself with, you know, small companies, medium-sized companies, large companies, um, early-stage products, late-stage products... You know, it's it still cracks me up to this day when I go on, you know, Twitter or Medium or anywhere, like, the, the, the passion with which people are like, no, this is the way that works. Um, right. And it's usually, it does, but in a specific situation. And, like, I know right. when I was at my last consulting company I worked for, I was trying to put together a framework of sorts where we could go into a company um, and look at like all the aspects of their delivery process and try to help them figure out, you know, a roadmap to improve some things. These were companies that were already very successful, but they right. were starting to hit issues where they couldn't scale and stuff like that. And I just, I think it's interesting how, you know, if you've got an early stage product where you need to be able to take risk, you need to be able to move quickly, you need to be able to build, you know, a little bit of time, there's a lot of uncertainty, like that culture, the processes that a team's going to pick, you know, whether they picked it or management picked it or whatever, are probably very different than a company that's like late stage, the product's getting ready for sunset, you know, at that yeah. point, they're only making incremental changes. And then management's looking at it at that point, like cost cutting. In other words, we're not making right. a lot of new revenue from this product. So let's be really measured about every little, you know, are you going to, are you going to take an hour off next Thursday? Cause we got to make oh, sure we fit funny. as much in as possible, you know? So it, it's just interesting to me, you know, depending on the company I go in, people have such a wildly different kind of perspective of a typical software development process um, because I think it's just so contextual you know it, it, right. it just depends so much and and so people well, think, leave yeah. these companies when they don't like something you know oh. and they go okay. join another company and then they try to recreate what they just didn't like and it doesn't work there because it's a different company you know I just it That's doesn't make funny. sense to I mean me. I think that there are you know yeah. I think that there are ways to I mean, if you've been doing it for a while, there's some general heuristics, right? For sure. You sort of, you, you have these gut instincts around doing that and, and you kind of, but, but I think that one thing that's actually very true is it's actually very difficult to d communicate heuristics because there's so much kind of like, yeah, buts. Sure. So I, I, it's funny, I was recently doing a consulting project and I sort of said, look, they're like, well, we don't, I gave a simple heuristic. And so they immediately took it too seriously and then did something that was a mess, right? Oh, no. And then they said, well, how do you didn't tell us that? And I was like, well, do you want me to tell you it? Like, you want me to break it down? 
Because if I do, it's going to be like 18 pages that you want that you should read. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, that's too much. Of course. Can you give us a simple heuristic to protect the heuristic? You know, so I was like, okay, well, why don't I get the heuristic and then I'll break it down into a paragraph of heuristics, so that you wouldn't have made that mistake. And so, sure. so they did that, and it was a paragraph for heuristics. And then they they went and made another mistake, and and then I started to feel really bad. I'm like, well, you know, either. You know, do you want to, you just want to pay me to just make sure you don't make the mistake? Like, I won't interrupt with anything, but if I see you about to make a very dire mistake, I, I will interject at that point, you know, to right. do that thing. So it's this, I think it's very interesting that if you've been doing it for a while, it's possible to, in your mind, very much like function off of patterns and say, oh, you know, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to prematurely optimize here and, and this is in the cost cutting mode and we want to change things. Right. It's a lot harder to describe it again if you haven't seen it and if you haven't done it. So I think that so so my answer to that there too is that you know imagine a team that's continuously improving and sensing the environment and tweaking. It is true you can evolutionary you can you can adapt to your surroundings. But I would say that if you have a knowledge gap about your surroundings, it's kind of like the problem like if if you put like city slickers in the woods you know, they will eventually learn how to be mountain men. Sure. But, but they might starve before they become mountain men. Right. But potentially, they, they might not make it to become mountain men. Right. right? So I think totally. that that's the interesting thing about contextual, you know, things being contextually correct and moving between companies and things, is that the reality is is that sometimes you will need to try to push changes in. Yes. Um, because the, the learning curve will be too steep to just wait and see if it evolves. Yep. And then at the other time, you need to invest a lot of time understanding what are the actual first principles that dictate why your environment is like it is. Yep. So for example, you know, a lot of people don't realize that most startup culture is based on how you're going to try to spend your money. Right. You know, you, you raise money and you spend it in 12 to 18 months. So there's a cycle from when you raise right. money. And so many of the decisions are about how proving why something you said in some pitch to get that money will come true in the next 12 to 18 months. So for the developers that sitting there and saying, oh my God, I can't believe we're you know, increasing so much tech debt and I have these conversations and people nod their head, but we don't do anything about it. This is a shit show. Mm -hmm. Once you understand that it is a controlled shit show, Right. In the hope, in, in in the hope that you will survive to raise another round of funding, and that you've volunteered to work in a startup that's venture back, so you you've agreed to play that game. Right. And you know, oh, your company decided that the latest pitch is to do enterprise deals, so that means that you're going to need to do a lot of stuff just to close the deal. Like once you start, but but a developer who just leaves that company in a huff, saying, oh, all startups are, are effed up and it's not worth being in it. You're not going to understand why it was effed up. Right. So the next company that you choose going to, you're not going to really relate to why. Right. Uh, uh, like, oh my God, this keeps happening in my career. Well, don't join a venture backed startup that's trying to do enterprise deals next time. Like, join a right. more bootstrapped, well established company. Like, example, my friend joined Home Depot to work in their UX team. And everyone would, if I said to a developer, like, you're going to join the big corporate Home Depot, they would say, well, well I don't know, you know. But Home Depot is a massively interesting logistics company, right? Oh, for sure. The work that they're doing in UX and Home Depot is fascinating. There's service design. There's a lot of, they have a lot of money to spend. They're actually investing a lot in DevOps. There's just a lot of stuff, cool stuff's happening. So I think a lot of developers think, and there's a lot of autonomy for the developers. So in, in this particular department, I don't know if, you know, all of Home Depot sure. is like that. But, you know, to the developer thinking, well, I'm never going to find independence unless I work at a startup. I'm never going to find this thing. That They'll miss these wonderful opportunities from a career perspective. Um, so you have to keep your eyes open for the pattern. I know this is a long, circuitous thing, but you, we were talking about patterns. But it kind of brought me to the idea of noticing patterns and how you choose your, your jobs as well. So For sure. Uh, I think it's important. No, it, it is. And I know, you know, and I... I think this is just an age thing, but I'm not totally sure. But, you know, like the first probably five, ten years of my career, uh, I think I was way more uptight than I needed to be that each, like, move I was going to make in my career right. or project I'd get on was advancing me or, you know, it's not a sunk cost or anything like that. Right. And, you know, when you get to, like, high, over 20 years doing this now, it's like, you know, 
if people really love doing this and they want to build great software products, you know, you're going to go to so many different companies and you're going to run right. into so many problems. I guess, you know, when I was talking at the beginning of the call about uncertainty and, and all that, um, I just really feel like one of the biggest things, and I know this is this gets into the whole psychological safety thing, but, um, you know, one of the biggest things that I think when I see a software team where there's like silliness going on, where there's like decision making between the business and how te the technical side's fulfilling what the business needs, and you talk to people and they're just like, this doesn't even make any sense. And you even talk to the right. business and it doesn't make sense. It usually comes down to somebody made a mistake in the past, you know, either right. putting something in place or they had a prior vendor and they just can't simply let it go or forgive that prior vendor. And, and, and even on my career, you know, I'm just as guilty of this. Maybe I work with somebody right. and I trust them and we work together for a number of years and maybe something happens and there's some trust broken there. Um, I really just feel like, you know, whether you're in an enterprise or a startup or whatever the heck you're doing, the better we can do as, you know, developers, product managers, executive, just everybody at just forgiving each other more often, <laughs> I think is yeah. <laughs> so huge because I think this whole, you know, in, and I know it's not every company, but there's a lot of companies where I can sense the fear the moment I'm brought into their first, you know, like, let's say it's a client, right. the first time I'm brought into a meeting where there's all these people, you know, like, oh God, I hope I don't make a mistake, you know, that he's going to find and so, like, I keep reading all this stuff about agile transformations, and I just keep thinking, you know, who these, what these people need? They need therapists, because you oh, know, at the well, end of the day, they need therapists, or they need to find. I mean, or right. they need to just move on in their career and find something that invigorates them. And like, right. So, so this is the thing that my whole agile transformation problem I have in my head is like, what is actually transforming? You know, if you take thirty percent of the people out of a company, is it still the same company? You know, like if you. If, if you just put some processes in place, are you really becoming a different company to work for? You know, right. or are you, you know, just like, I mean, you can go into a company and just do some simple limiting work in progress and you can, you can speed up work going through the sure. system. And so you can get kind of immediate results. And I right. think that it's I, this whole thing of like, I think the reality for a lot of people is can you, and I think it's by, it's by leading by example. Yes. Like, I think that it's so easy to be the person who's just kind of like, well, you know, this code is so crufty or, you know, we're never going to fix this. We, we all have fundamental attribution error all the time in our work about sort of, so right. I think that that's really where, you know, and, and this is the thing too about the little leadership circles that you can create in your companies. Like I've seen companies where, you know, there's a lot of bullshit going on in the organization, but the small little team comes to work and feels a lot of pride with what they do. They kind of, are they transparent about their work? They, they, they chip away at their continuous improvement problems. They chip away at their technical debt. They're very like clear about what they do. And you know what? They have a lot of pride in what they're doing, even though that the org is kind of swirling around them. Sure. They just kind of like, they say no to people, you know, they don't overcommit. They do these things. Right. And so I think that it's like, but, but a lot of that, so just by having that pod of people and they like their manager, you know, if they have a direct manager, they like, they have a good relationship. So I think that it just starts with, you can break a culture of fear and, and trust issues it's like that by just creating good pods of things instead of like, and instead of needing to have like a big kumbaya moment with your company and sort of, this is the thing about psychological safety is I think that it's. It, it, there's a lot of talk about it, but how do you actually create it? And so I thought a lot about this and I thought, look, a lot of companies are literally like geopolitical conflicts. Yep. You know, the, like it's, it's the, it's, you know, Northern Ireland and, and, and England. I mean, it's, it's that bad, right? Right. So there's no amount of, there's no amount of rationalizing the need for psychological safety that's going to fix it. Exactly. The only way out of it is small promises kept. Yes. You know, and just kind of like, you you know, and so I've had some luck lately just saying to people like, wait, can we just be clear? No one trusts each other in this room. Like if we can just embrace that and put a smile on our face and say, you know what? You're right. No one trusts each other in this room. Yep. It's all for systemic reasons too. Let's acknowledge that probably most of this is for systems reasons, unless we think it's personal reasons. 
So let's just yeah. try to acknowledge that and kind of move and, and move our way, you know, from the bat to do that thing. Um, but, you know, I'm getting these kind of like impassioned texts and I think maybe the gas did run out. Um, so I have to go. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's um, okay. You, hey, this was perfect. You, did you get like enough material? And stuff oh, to, this was, this was great, man. No, I really appreciate it. We'll do this another time too. Cause like cool. we could yeah, go let's follow up. way so off the ideas. deep end. Yeah, to do these but I, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to, I just have to you gotta go. just jump in an Uber and leave the car in the side of the road. Okay. I'm going to talk to totally you. Totally understand. Thanks for doing this. I really appreciate I it. I totally just messed up. You saw the beginning part where I did the whole guy thing that it's not going to run out. <laughs> I've totally, I have totally messed up now. No, you're, you're Please great, man. have faith in me. Okay. All right. Bye. bye Take bye, it easy, bye, man. Bye. <laughs> bye.